Hi everyone, I'm going to do a quick speed run through a few highlighted features in .NET 8. So, I'm Ryan, I am a, I'm the Software and Solutions Lead at Tap2. The, we're a small Adelaide-based group. We do custom software, we do cybersecurity stuff, we do human-centered design, and we do digital leadership and do some really cool things in those spaces. So, let's get on with the show. I'm going to jump straight into demos. So, the first feature I want to talk about is a logging upgrade. Previously, all right, let me introduce the demo first, actually. Here, I have a simple demo with a basic controller, data interaction, and I've got a bunch of functions that get and set a static number or string. Simple enough. Previously, if, say, I wanted to log every endpoint call in my application logs, I could just add a logger.getInformation line to, uh, to the controllers, and that will cause a log statement to be triggered. Since .NET 6, there has been an attribute that you can add to things that will make this a little bit more consistent. So now, what, I can, what you can do is you can create a function. In this case, I've created a partial function called log request, and I've added a logger message attribute onto it. So what this attribute does is it says, please compiler, generate me a logging function into this partial function that I've declared here. And what's new in .NET 8 is they've actually added some overloads to this attribute to actually make it useful for a lot more use cases. So let's compare and contrast. If I was to go and start the application, I have over here some Postman endpoints. And I'm going to start and hit the data interaction old. So it's the old one using the classic method of logging. And I'll do a get int. And that will get me my zero. And I'll see a log statement telling me that get int has been hit. Excellent. Now, if I want to switch over to the new one, what will happen is it will hit the same thing and I'll get a log statement saying the get int has been hit despite hitting a different endpoint and using this new log function. That all seems pretty rudimentary out of the gate. I can write a, just a logger.log information, no problem. This just constrains me. It adds consistency and it lets you format your log statements and your data that goes into them in a certain way. But I think the real killer feature here is there's actually another new feature being added to it. So suppose I'm not just dealing with ints and strings and I want to actually put that information into my logs. So what I've done here is I've created a El Classico weather forecast, if you're familiar with any of the .NET templates, and functions to get and set a forecast. And as part of these, they either get or set a weather forecast model. If I was to try and log that in the log information, I would have to log each property individually. For a weather forecast, not end of the world, it's four properties, but suppose your model had 20 or 30 properties. Suddenly that becomes a bit more of a mission. What I can now do is I can add an attribute. Let me just make this a bit bigger so you can see it. I've created a static um, partial, same as before, but now I can add an extra attribute into it called that I'm tagging with the attribute log properties. What this attribute does is it tells the source generator that's generating my logging function to log all of the properties of this model into my logs. And so I'm going to do a couple of things to show this because the console logs will only show a base message. So I'm going to switch my console over to use JSON logging format. Test that's going to play nice. And I'll see that log format's been changed. 
And so now I'm going to try and set the forecast to the forecast for today. 21, and it's a nice day for .NET. And so what I'll see now is I have the message telling me that set forecast has been hit. That's the same message that I sent to it. Or that I put in, let me just bring up the log message again. Endpoint has been hit, so I get my message as before. But now I get a bunch of extra data attached to the logging state. I get the forecast summary, the temperature Fahrenheit, temperature Celsius, and the date. All of those properties that were encapsulated into that weather forecast. So now if I have common models that I want to just be included in logs in certain situations, I can just add that as a log properties into these logging statements and get all that data into my logs. One more thing I'll quickly show you. Suppose that we didn't want all the properties when we're doing logging because I don't know about you, my models have a lot of stuff. Only half of it's probably useful for any sort of diagnostics. A lot, a lot of it's just metadata or user data that I don't care about. There is another attribute called log property ignore. And it does exactly what it sounds like. So let me just go ahead and rebuild that because that will need to recompile. So now if I do set forecast, switch, show my console, I'll see that I have the summary, the temperature C, and the date, all there, but not, no longer temperature Fahrenheit. How we time? Ah, time for one more sneak peek. <laughs> so we're logging some interesting things. So let's actually have a peek at what, it's, what the source generator is actually doing for us and see what the generated code looks like. So I'm just going to add a breakpoint and then step into the generated function. Ah, maybe I have to fully restart it because I made a change. Step into the function, and I'll see that I have a whole function generated here that fills in the partial void that I had previously. So first thing it does is it's shortcutting the log if the logs level is not enabled. If I'm doing a log information and I've got my log level set to warning, this just exits out here, doesn't do any other work, any other allocation. So this is just a best practice that is implemented in the log properties source generator to try and make it as efficient as possible. Now, this is not how you would normally think to do your logs, for most of us at least. What it's doing is it's actually doing part of the logger's work up here so it can line things up as quickly and efficiently as possible. So it's getting a local state from the logger. It's then reserving its space to add all of the properties that it's been told to add, and it will generate. That's how the log properties works. It will actually generate an, a line for each property that it needs to add into the logs and adds them all to the log state, and then go ahead and actually execute the log. And so that's how it's, that's what the code looks like. That's how it's generating these things and how it's mapping all the properties from your model. This only works for public properties. You, you can't do it for private properties. It has to be able to see them. And it will add them all down here. Pretty neat. Some benefits there. And there's definitely some time savings in terms of that log properties in particular. All right, let me just bring up run sheet. What's next on the agenda? Ah, next up, keyed services. Oh, one thing I need to mention that my notes tell me, this all happens from, where is my csproj? To actually use this stuff, you need to include the package Microsoft extensions telemetry abstractions. That's what actually gives you that attribute and the source generator that does your log generation. You need to use that, otherwise it doesn't work. All right, next up, keyed services. So traditionally, if I wanted to declare a dependency injection service, what I would do is I would have an implementation and the interface for it, and I'd declare builder.services.adscoped or some variant thereof, depending on how I'm setting up my program.cs, and add my service and its implementation 
file service and the actual thing that does it. That works great for 90% of services. And this is something that's close to my heart because this has always been a pet peeve of mine with dependency injection as well, that it's lacked this flexibility. Suppose that I have a file service let me just skip ahead to that, that has get file and upload file. A file service could be a lot of things. And so suppose that I actually have three implementations for it. One that goes to a cloud blob, the blob service. One that goes to a local file, the file service. And one that's a stub that's great for testing. And I want to be able to switch between them so I can choose which implementation I use at any given point at runtime. Previously, you could do that with a bunch of extra steps. You had to declare all of those services, get the alter resulting enumerable out, do a check of type, and get the appropriate one. Not, not a good time and not a great solution. What you can now do is, let me give us some space, is you can declare an Instead of just add scoped, you can add keyed services. So rather than add scoped, use add keyed scoped or keyed transient or keyed. I believe keyed singleton is a thing. I haven't tried that one though. But you can add a keyed version of the service. So what I've done here is I've declared three file services. My, my first one, that's a blob service, and I've added a key. I've, I've just created a constant for it because I refuse to use magic strings, but these are just constant strings that I'm using as my keys, blob service, file service, and stub service. And so I'm declaring the blob service with the key of blob service, the file service with the key of file service, the stub service with the key of stub service. So what that lets me do is in my controller, the file interaction controller, I can now create a function that gets me an appropriate file service. And so I have feature flags in my application not that unusual. And so I, if I have blob enabled, I will try and get my, get my required keyed service using the blob service key. If my file storage else, if my file storage flag is on, so if no blob, I'll fall across to file. If my file storage feature flag is enabled, then I'll use my file service implementation. If neither of those feature flags are on, then I will fall back to the stub service implementation. And so that is letting me choose at runtime which version of this I want to use. And so when I am um, trying to submit a file, I get the file out of the request, and then I can just call my get appropriate file service. You can do this in line if you want, and then use that service. So let's, let's boot it up. I'm just going to make sure that I'm just going to remove this uh, because the console logs are way easier to read when they're not in JSON format. And scooch across to my file controller. And now go to my next endpoint. I'm going to submit a file. So this is an endpoint that calls my API then file interaction, because that's the name of the controller and the path to it. And I'm sending a, my run sheet for this talk to it because it's an easy and available file. So when I send the request, oh, it's not running. Let me just run the app. When I send it, I'll see that the upload file async was called for the file service. And the reason it was called for the file service is because in my app settings, if I have a look at my feature flag, I'll see that I have the file storage flag on. If that file storage flag is off, save that. Now it's calling it for the stub service because that different features on. And so I can choose at runtime what implementation of a service I want by using keyed services, which is great. Now, if you want to use them normally still, you can still do that because I normally don't use the um, keyed 
the service provider to do things, I normally like to use attributes for it. Let me just give some space again. So if you want to just get a specific keyed service injected into a um, constructor or into a function, you can just add the attribute from keyed services and provide the key. And that's specifying which implementation of the service that you want. So in this particular one, I've got two functions, one that submits file to disk and one that submits file stub. And I'll see my keyed services are, one will access the, using the file service key and one will access using the stub service key. And then just do exactly the same thing. This is just to show that you can pull whichever one you want in the constructor or in the method name. And so if I go and hit those endpoints, submit the file. Um, if you are using keyed services, you will need to add the attribute to tell it which key you're using whenever you're injecting the constructor. What you can do if you want to default is you can declare it as a keyed service and as a non-keyed service. So in my program, you'll notice that I've declared the file service as a plain one and as a keyed one. This will not work well for singleton because you'll actually get a separate instance for a singleton service working this way. But for a scoped service, you can set a default by doing this, so, if that makes sense. Is there a way for it to work with the feature flags? Uh, sorry? Is, is there a way for you to you know, define it in one central place, like either through a feature flag or on the startup, so that you don't have to specify the key? Uh, uh, yes. For example, you want to switch from there, like stop to uh, blob storage, do it in the startup or as a feature flag. So, so this, this, this you could do it in startup before by just commenting out, suppose I wanted file service, I could say, and I could choose it by just changing the app itself and say, okay, I want it to be file service today or I want it to be blob service. At runtime, what happens if you do both of these and this is the same as if you do it for a keyed service. If you add two services with the same key, this is essentially a keyed service with no key. Um, it will always give you the last service declared. What you can do is you can get an enumerable of these services. So in, if instead of requesting an I file service, you request an I enumerable of I file service, it will give you an enumerable with both services in it. And you can choose with that, which is the old way of having to pick a service when there's multiple implementations. Which, which is not fun, fun but, but it, it does let you do things like, like I want this to apply to all services that do this. So I want it to be sent to file and blob. You can actually do that. Hopefully that answered the question. Cool. So I'm just going to quickly go ahead and send it to the file service and I'll see that it's injected the file service by in this force file endpoint. And if I go to my force stub endpoint, it will upload it to the stub service. And I can see my little file in its run sheet .md in its little file storage location where it gets downloaded to. And where's my postman gone? There it is. And go and get it back out. And it will fetch it from, oh, it's configured to stub at the moment, because this is normal. And so if I turn the file service back on with my app settings, true, turn that back on, go ahead, get the file back, and I'll get my and I'll get my file out of that endpoint. All right. Let me just quickly check, check that run sheet to make sure I haven't missed anything important on keyed services. Nope, excellent. All right, next topic, HTTP resilience. Now this one is actually way cooler than I thought it would be. This works way better than I was expecting. So let me just um, cancel out those changes so that I'm not accidentally breaking a demo because you do not want to anger the demo gods. 
let me introduce you to another friend of an API. Here I've got a more basic weather forecast controller, pretty much straight out of the demo with a couple of tweaks. I've changed the default endpoint to be called reliable, so it's get. Um, so it's get the reliable version of the weather forecast, and it gets me the thing. I've also created a couple more endpoints that are a little bit badly written. Um, I've got an unreliable endpoint. So what this one will do is it will only work every third time. Third time's the charm. But every, but all the other times, it will just throw a 500 exception, telling, it, telling you it's unreliable. I've also written an even worse endpoint that never works and will always throw a 500 error. There's a fourth um, musketeer. And that one is a slow one, where I've deliberately added delay to every other request. So these are going to be our cast of characters. Let me just um, let me just boot this one up, make sure it's running. Cool. On our on our main characters side, on the main API, I've created a hottest day controller. And what this does is it calls an external API to get a forecast and gives you back the hottest day in that forecast. Pretty simple. So in a traditional world, what you, can, what you do is in your program.cs, you, you add your HTTP client factory, and then you get, add your HTTP client factory, you get a client. Excellent. You generate the request message, and then you get the response from the API. Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm just logging it using the same log prop, logging attribute as, oh, pardon me, as before. And that's just another partial void using um, the old trick of log a message. And I'm just passing in the status code and the endpoint into that log. So you'll be seeing a few of them soon. So for my standard endpoint, I've got an echo of reliable and unreliable. Let's go hit them. So my standard reliable one, it will go ahead and it will get me a forecast. Isn't that nice? And it will, it's reliable endpoint, it just works. And this is what it is most of the time for your APIs. Network traffic just works, it all goes through, especially when you're deving locally. But if you try and hit an unreliable endpoint, it can fail, and it can fail again. And then third time's a charm, it might succeed. <laughs> and so we don't want that. We want to be able to handle these kind of weird network issues, these intermittent problems that other APIs can throw at us. And that is where resilience handlers come in. So this is something they've added in .NET 8. And they've done a lot of collaboration with the Poly library and integrated Poly library into the base ASP.NET Core to make all this work. So let me show you the first up. There is one package you'll need for this. You need to add the Microsoft Extensions HTTP Resilience package to get these HTTP Resilience things I'm about to show you. And then in program, what, I can, what you can do is, here is my standard HTTP client. That's the one that my standard API is using. I've also created a second HTTP client that I've named Resilience. Because you, you can have keyed HTTP clients. It'll get you the corresponding one to the corresponding key. It's much the same as keyed services, actually. But it's all in the factory. And I've added one extra configuration line. One line, the add standards resilience handlers. Well, sorry, add standard resilience handler. And what that line does is that adds a bunch of things into the HTTP processing pipeline that handles a lot of common network issues using some Microsoft chosen sensible defaults. Sensible is always use case dependent. Defaults are great, particularly for demo. Um, I will show you a few of the tweaks you can make to it in a, at the end of this. So what I can, what I do with that is I can use my resilience API. I can create a client with, 
I can create one of my new clients that has the resilience handlers and try and do the same thing. So I call my resilient reliable endpoint and it still works. It, it, it just works because it passes through and doesn't have to catch anything. But now if I hit my unreliable endpoints, what it will do is I'll see a few things in console here. I will see that it did an attempt and failed with a 500 error. Then it waited a teeny bit, then it did another attempt and received a 500 error. And then it waited a bit more, it has an exponentially backing off retry policy by default. And then the third time it received it. But from the caller's perspective, the call our API, it just worked. I send it, it fails a couple times internally, and then I get a response. Success. And I get my 51 degree day, freaking hell. <laughs> cool. So what about if we throw some extra wrinkles into it? What about if it's a non-existent endpoint? So this one will throw a 404 and you'll see it returns immediately. So by default, it only has some error codes it'll retry on. 500 will retry on, too many requests, it will wait a while longer and then retry on. 404 is a, by default, a non-retriable error code and so it'll immediately fall back and fail over to you if it receives a 404 error. And so you'll see that there's no retries, no delays, it just passes it straight back. What about a totally balked endpoint? my one that never works. What this will do is it will continue on as if it was as the previous one did, 500, 500 with all ever increasing backing off retries. And then after it'll make five attempts, um, after the fifth attempt fails, it will then fall back. So the default is five for number of retries. The last one is the slow endpoint. So what I've done with this endpoint in our unreliable API is I've added a 15 second delay on every other request. So if I call that, I'll see that we're here twiddling our thumbs for a bit. And what will happen is that Poly by default has a 10 second timeout, which is something you should be careful of if you do have long running requests. And so what happens is it will um, force itself to do a timeout it will cat and then it will time that request out. So Polly here will just um, say timeout events and then try again. Because it's every other time that it's slow, it works the second time. If it was an endpoint, this is a classic. Defaults are great for most of the time. If your endpoint always takes 15 seconds to return, this will never work. So use with a little caution. But that's a brief demo of some of the new resilience features that get added into it. I'm gonna quickly, really quickly, show a few, few more pieces. Um, you, can do some basic, you can do some extra configuration of it. So rather than just adding standard resilience handlers with nothing, you can feed an options object and set some extra boundaries. So here I can set the retry to say, retry on a not found exception, for instance. You can also go one step further and create a whole custom HTTP pipeline and inject all your own stuff into it. I haven't looked into that, but that's if you want something even more customized on top of this function. That is all four, of, sorry, all three of the features. So, light speed recap, logging improvements. There's new overloads for the logger message. It existed in, since .NET 6, but now it's actually, you can actually pass it way more things and give it a bit more power. The source generator behind it has been completely overhauled for .NET 8 as well. It looks quite different to what it used to. The log properties attribute is a big one. You can log all the properties of your methods straight into your um, structured logging. And the source generators do make logging that little bit faster. Keyed services. You can now declare specific implementations of a service using a named key. Store it as a constant, don't use magic strings and you can then retrieve the implementations by using that same key and its attributes to maintain the same sort of pattern as before. HTTP resilience, 
you can now quite easily add a bunch of retry logic and timeout logic into your HTTP clients with very little effort and a bit of tweaking if you have specific use cases beyond what are considered the standards. Cool. Um, I'm a little over time, but have time for a couple of quick questions if anyone has them. John. John. With um, uh, resilience in .NET 8, with that uh, configuration API and dependency injection registration, um, how does that relate to poly? Is poly separate to .NET still, or has .NET provided a configuration interface that poly is compatible with? So, so poly, poly was a separate library for .NET. It's been merged into the core of the HTTP resilience library now. Okay. Um, poly still exists, and it exists for back compatibility. For back compatibility. So if people who were, who were using poly prior to this merge can still just keep using that poly library, and it'll still just keep working. Yep. Um, when you are declaring your using statements for some of these functions, a lot of them are still using the same namespace, so you'll still be using poly a lot, but it's all in that Microsoft extensions HTTP resilience library now. So it's all native, not a third, not strictly entirely a third party library. So it's a merger. Cool. All right. Oh, one question. The resilience events that you had just now, were they all simulated? Can it be as how did you simulate them? <laughs> um, so the question was, those events that we just saw, were they simulated? Uh, the answer is yes. I made the custom unreliable API that failed every third request. So that is, by definition, simulating failures. If you were to try and get a real system and inject values into it, you probably have to go and fuddle with the destinations or source systems to cause them to throw the failures to allow you to test it. Transient failures are notoriously hard to reproduce intentionally, but maybe you'll have better luck. <laughs> Uh, so the timeout sends a cancellation token, which cancels the request. Okay. So the request will be cancelled before it returns. Okay. And the other question was, is this only for GET? Is this for GET? Uh, no, this can be for any um, HTTP operation. I've just used GET because they're easier, but you can use this for a POST. I am going to assume you can use it for any HTTP protocol because it's just on top of the HTTP client. I've only tried it with GET and POST. I haven't tried it with a DELETE or a PUT or any of the other more niche ones. Yes, that's a good point. I don't know what its behavior is for a long post, if it'll time that out. That's a good question. I'll have to check that one. All right. Oh, for the 15 second endpoint, could we configure the resilience API to accept that? 100%. You could change the time out to 20 seconds. But then would it like, impact other, you know, which would, like, other endpoints which would have returned early, but now they would wait longer? Uh, the timeout is the timeout of the request. And so if the request returns before the timeout, there's no problem and it will just return all the way through. There's no problem. No. If you want different timeouts on different HTTP clients, you actually have to create different HTTP clients. So you can have a HTTP client resilient low timeout, HTTP client resilient high timeout, and choose the appropriate one for the appropriate circumstance if you have some that you want to have long timeouts on, some that you want to have short timeouts on. The key HTTP clients are quite useful for having different resilience um, patterns for different APIs. All right, I'll call it there. Thank you all very much for listening, and I'll pass over to John.
Just going to change my display to multi. Display. Alrighty, check, check, one, two. We're good to go. Hi everyone, um, I'm John Merchant. I uh, am a software engineer with Mantel Group. Um, we do software technology consulting. Uh, one of the many technologies we work with are Microsoft technologies. So we work with uh, .NET and Azure and we are a Microsoft uh, certified partner in um, many certifications. So a little bit about myself. Um, I've been .NET developer for over a decade now. Um, and you can find me on the many socials, um, LinkedIn, on the website formerly known as Twitter. Just search um, for John Merchant and look for the grinning fellow with a mustache. So is anyone familiar with Blazor? Uh, have many people used it before? Cool. So everyone's quite familiar with the current state of play with Blazor. We can build, as of .NET 7, we can build interactive web applications with C Sharp and Razor. Um, we can host them on the server side with full interactivity with uh, the state being streamed over Signaler and, uh, or WebSockets. Um, or, or we can host the, the Blazor applications in WebAssembly in the browser. Uh, and additionally, there is also the hybrid um, hosting model, which we can um, host uh, server-side uh, native mobile apps with uh, Maui. But I am not a mobile developer, so I don't know much about that. <laughs> um, so we have two hosting models. Um, we know we have Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. So Blazor Server. Um, entire state is managed on the server and the web browser knows about it by interacting with the server over WebSockets. And the state comes in um, via uh, serialized DOM nodes and uh, serialized DOM events back up to the server. So when you click a button in Blazor, it tells the server over signal that you've clicked a button, invoke this event on the server. The server then does runs your c -sharp code to update the state of your component the component then is the new DOM state of that component that's then transmitted back down to the browser, pushed down to the browser by WebSockets, um, and then re-renders, is applied to the DOM and your browser shows the new state of the DOM. Now with Blazor WebAssembly, um, instead of um, all that happening on the server and that being transferred between um, your browser and the server over WebSockets, that all happens in the client. So, what you have is a, the full .NET runtime. It's actually Mono that's been compiled with um, a tool called, oh, I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's, it's a mscripten. It's Mono that's been compiled with mscripten to WebAssembly and it's run in the browser as a WebAssembly executable. The full .NET runtime, you've got everything. You've got your system collections. You've got all the APIs you know and love um, that you typically run in your operating system, but in the browser. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the hosting models um, in Blazor, there's a link down there to uh, hosting models. So that's the current state of play as of .NET 7, but what's new with .NET 8? So has, any, has many people seen the uh, prototype by S Steve Sanderson from Microsoft called Blazor United? There was a prototype video about, about a year ago where he showed off um, basically how to bring together um, uh, WebAssembly components and server-side rendering components in the same context. So many people have seen that demo? It was really cool, and um, at the time, it was pretty revolutionary when we first saw it. But since then, um, 
the concepts from Blazor United uh, were sort of solidified in .NET 8 into um, re the new render modes and um, static server-side rendering features that we now have in .NET 8 Blazor. So, uh, are, are many people front-end developers? Uh, React? Many React developers? Um, is anyone familiar with Next.js? So Next.js has um, client components and server-side components. So um, Blazor um, static server-side rendering and client com and, and different render modes have taken a little bit of inspiration from how Next.js does server-side rendering. Um, so Previously with server-side rendering um, and Blazor, uh, pretty much the only way to do static server-side rendering was with something called Razor Pages. Um, you would have a Blazor server and if you wanted a non-interactive Razor component rendered, um, you would have to use Razor Pages, which was comparable to uh, ASP.NET Web Forms in a way. So previously in Blazor server-side applications, we had um, we had uh, server-side interactivity, as I was explaining before. You would uh, the browser would communicate back and forth with the server, and that would happen over Signaler and WebSockets. Um, whereas if you wanted a client-side um, components application. It would have to be a separate um, application entirely. You couldn't mix um, server-side interactivity and client-side interactivity. It had to be separate projects. But now with um, Blazor and .NET 8, uh, we can bring that to all together in a comprehensive model. So another thing this actually lets us do now is we can pre-render the client side interactive components. So we can actually render those um, WebAssembly components on the server um, and present them to the user in the browser before the entire, um, before the entire uh, WebAssembly runtime is brought up in .NET. So it greatly increases rendering times. So the first new render mode is static server-side rendering. So a static, a static server-side rendered component in Blazor is um, essentially like a PHP page. It has no support for interact interactivity except for basic um, form postback. So we can um, either from a static server-side component, we can either render other static server-side components or we can render interactive server components or WebAssembly client components. And also with static server-side rendering, we can stream the page as it's being rendered so if your Blazor components on initialize method um, has multiple uh, uh, async tasks that are awaited and change the state of the page and render or render the re-render the page, you can actually stream those updates as they happen to the client. So server-side interactivity. That's, that's the same as with Blazor server applications, the WebSocket back and forth um, concept. So you've got all the same features you already know about. You can um, open up, say, a, a, a entity framework context and query it and then write the result to um, properties in your Blazor component and have those properties rendered. And um, we can yeah, render these in static server components from the uh, server. So, 
So with client-side interactive components, these are components that um, are rendered in WebAssembly, like in the .NET runtime in WebAssembly. They must now be defined in a separate Blazor WebAssembly project. Um, so in your typical setup, you'll have your Blazor server application, which hosts your application, as well as defines the Blazor server-side um, and server-side interactive components, and then that project will reference a separate Blazor WebAssembly project where you define your client-side components. And those components will have all the same features you already know with um, Blazor WebAssembly, and you can render them from static server components as well. You can't render them from interactive server components. That sort of breaks the model, so that's not allowed. So with automatic rendering, you can take a client WebAssembly component, um, and for the first initial render of that component, it happens on the server side, and then subsequent renders happen on the client side in, in WebAssembly as soon as that, uh, the WebAssembly runtime comes up. So that means you could have a sort of a site that um, the initial component is rendered on the server side and then subsequent loads of it are rendered on the client side, um, much like how that would happen in um, Next.js. So the advantage of that is initial page loads are quicker Oh no, I deleted something. And um, you get client-side interactivity without, um, oh dear, I forgot what that dot point was about. Yeah, you get client-side interactivity, e exactly. <laughs> How embarrassing. So limitations are it cannot depend on server-side state. Um, so for example, with one of these components, you could not um, open an entity framework DB context and read it because once it's rendered on the client side of WebAssembly, it doesn't know about the entity framework database. You can't access it from the client side. So you need to be a little bit creative with how you um, access or provide these components with data. And yeah, part of that complicates data fetching. So now I'll show off the new features. So I've taken um, Martin Fowles, um, oh, sorry, David Fowles' um, uh, to-do API repository, which is a popular um, example of a full stack.net application and I've ported the front-end project to use the uh, new features in, in Blazor and .NET 8. So I've taken the front-end project, with, which was previously a Blazor uh, WebAssembly client-side project, and I've taken it and I've split it into a server-side project as well as a client-side project. So we've got two projects to do web client server, which serves the application, and to do web client WASM, which provides our server application with a client side component that we're, we will be able to render. And I've pushed the source code up to uh, github.com slash John Merchant slash to do API. So I'm going to change my. Um, display. And I'm going to mirror it. How's that looking? That's looking good. So here we have a login form. This is actually mostly the same code as to do API um, initially had. Um, this is a Blazor 
a, a razor page. So I'll show you how a razor page looks like. We have this pages folder in our solution. And we have this login.cshtml um, file. So that's the um, template. And with this razor page file, we define a login model that we post to and we post the username and password. And we need this because um, we use a HTTP context to sign in. So one of the limitations with Blazor server static components is they behave mostly the same as uh, Razor pages, except we can't access the uh, HTTP context. So that's why we still need to use this uh, Razor page to sign us in. So I'll sign us in now. Authenticated. So I'll go over the structure of this application. We have a to-do list component. Um, all of these components are um, rendered from a static component. So I'll show you what the static component is. This is the application component. And then we render this to-do app component. The render mode here is, um, again, st a static server component. So there's nothing going on in this component except for rendering other components and defining their render mode. So here we have the actual to-do list um, component. And here we explicitly define that its render mode is interactive server. So at this point, we're telling Blazor, okay, with this component, we allow um, events to be transmitted to the server and the state to be streamed back to the server or to the client. So I'm gonna demonstrate how that happens. So we have this to-do list application, we have some input happening and then we can see with this WebSocket that we have open that it's sending and tr transmitting binary payloads uh, over Signaler in a format called BlazorPack, which is how it serializes the DOM events and the DOM nodes. So these messages that you see here, these are just keep alive ping messages. It stops the, um, stops the session from going to sleep. So if I were to close my um, laptop, it would actually start a new signaler session. But because we have these ping messages, it, it will keep the session alive. So if I click this add to do button, it's going to transmit a event to the server. We should be able to see it here or this frame. Here it is. We can see the submit event in the payload there. So that's been sent to the server. The server does, uh, renders your component, runs it, and then it responds with a, a message with the DOM state that has changed, if I can find it. I believe it is this one that is the payload. JS render batch. And you can see some HTML there in the payload. So all very low level serialization stuff happening. It has to be kind of obfuscated for it to be fast. So demonstrating more um, server side interactivity. I can check and uncheck these components and these are events that are transmitted back and forth from the server and, and the browser.
to-do list. So we have this input checkbox component. And on click, we'll call this toggle to do event. And at this point, it's running on the server. And then the server invokes some um, backend um, API update to do async. And then the state is transmitted back to the browser. So that's a basic demo of uh, server-side interactivity. But what about client-side interactivity? So we have a component here called report. That is being rendered from a static or the static um, server component. Um, I'll quickly show you how that looks. So we have our to-do list application, which is uh, a interactive server component. And here we have our report component, which is defined in this separate WASM project. So what does this report component do? It renders a pie chart of um, the to-do and done counts. And this actually uses a library called chart.js to do so. So because um, this is a very intensive process to run um, uh, all the JS JavaScript invocations, we want that to run on the client side. So that's why this has been defined as a client side component. So basically we take in these properties, um, the to do and done counts, we pass it to a pie chart component and that will be rendered in the browser. So I'm just going to clear my request history if I can. That should be enough. So I'm going to hit load chart and see what happens. So we can see that it's downloaded the .NET runtime and the .NET, um, another .NET library as well. And it's brought up um, .NET in a WebAssembly context. It's brought up um, the Blazor framework in the WebAssembly context. And we've rendered this um, component entirely in WebAssembly and written it to the browser. Now this component actually had to send an API request to the server to get its data. It had to fetch um, the latest to-do state from the server. So that's what I was talking about before with um, sort of mixing client-side components and server-side interactive components um, complicates data fetching a bit. So each component needs to be aware of where it's getting its data from. So we just create a HTTP client here and we fetch it from a to-do's API from the backend. So quick question time, if anyone has questions. Yes. yes. Is there any way to trigger the reload events from the checkboxes, given that, that they're in different random modes? Um, what do you mean by reload events? So to ah. tell your chart that an event has triggered that you need to refresh your data. So, so you, you will need, need to create, create a signal, signal hub for that. And the um, Blazor WebAssembly component, that would need to open a signaler context and your Blazor server component will have to know about the hub as well and then share that data with the hub. So essentially you've got to get a connection and then you've got to echo that back out of the server again to tell the report to reload. 
yep. that then goes and then fetches the data. Yes. yes. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Back to you, David. Uh, bringing it home, um, we're going to race through. Thanks, Ryan. Um, what's new in C sharp 12? Before we do that, I'm just going to indulge myself with a quick photo. I'm also going to let you know that table over there without the pizza on it has got a whole bunch of swag. I don't want to take it home. So before you leave, go over there, grab stuff, take it home. Um, give it to someone you love or uh, keep it yourself, I don't mind, but I don't want it back. So, <laughs> so there, there's all kinds of interesting things over there, so make sure you grab some of that. All right, C-sharp 12, let's go. We've got eight features. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes, so I think we'll get there. All right, the first uh, new feature in C-sharp 12 is primary constructors. So, um, We've had our traditional constructors, uh, I guess, pretty much ever since C Sharp 1. Um, so we, we can see on the screen here, we've, we've got a class, we've got our constructor that takes a, a, a name string argument, and then we can use that name and uh, set our um, private property to that, or we can use it as a set a field to it. So that's, that's how we've done stuff uh, forever in, in C Sharp in .NET. Um, then along came uh, records uh, in recent versions of .NET and we were able to uh, create a record type um, and use a, um, a primary constructor for the record type and just basically have a one line. So you could have your a record, then the, the name of the record and then any um, uh, properties of that you could just define in one line. That was really nice. So we've now got a similar kind of syntax for our classes and our regular structs. So um, here's our primary constructor. And so you'll see there's no separate uh, constructor method here. Um, we've got some other properties and other methods, but now because we've got um, up in the, the class line there, we've got that uh, brackets and, and one or more um, arguments to make this type. Um, that's going to generate our constructor for us. So that's our primary constructor. So we can still refer to that, that name argument here. So we can use that to, to assign that to a property or um, a field. We can even refer to it inside a method. But um, that value is only accessible inside the class. So you can't, you can't do um, whatever the object is, dot lowercase name. Um, it's only visible inside that class. We've also got the ability to do that for structs as well. So here's an example using a struct. Um, again, we can um, use that value anywhere in here. Um, so the nice thing with classes is with a primary constructor is that that is the constructor for that type. It means that you're guaranteed that those um, parameters have been supplied. So if you Define, you can still define other constructors on that class, but they need to call back to that primary constructor. So if you've got another constructor that takes different parameters, you've still got to call back to this brackets and then pass in the values it needs. For a struct with a primary constructor, um, because it's a value type, um, you, you don't have to always call a constructor on a struct. Um, there is a chance that any fields could get initialized to, to null or to zero. Um, but just, just as you could now with a, with a struct type. So something to be aware of. So here we are, we're, we're just creating an instance of that type. And so if I 
look at the, the things that are there, you'll see there, there's a thing, but I can't see that the name is not there. Um, it's, it's just internal to the class. Okay, next feature is collection expressions. Not that file. Um, so again, we've, we've had collections, so we've got an array here of numbers. We've got a list of numbers as well. Um, and we can, already we can assign values to those using this kind of syntax where we're, we're newing up a, a new instance of that type for these two fields. Um, likewise, in a method, we might create a new list and then just add manually values to that list. Um, so these are all collections, arrays and, and lists and, and other types as well. Um, we might even want to pass in uh, an array. And so we can use that kind of syntax. We've had that for a little while now. Uh, so now with collection expressions, we can simplify that even further. If I can click on the right thing, there we go. So now we can just use the square brackets. So we don't have to do the new type stuff. We can simplify it even further to say just square bracket and the values you want in your array and assign that to whatever the, the thing is, whether it's a, a field or a property or a, or a variable. Um, so we can use that all over the place. So we've, it doesn't matter if it's an array or a, um, a collection type, um, like a generic type here. Um, so one interesting thing, we can't, we do have to specify the type. So I can't just say var other stuff equals and square brackets. Uh, it's going to complain because it doesn't know. Is this an array? Is it a list? Is it some other kind of custom collection? Who knows? Uh, it can't guess. Unfortunately, that guessing in C Sharp is a future version feature, I think. So. <laughs> or maybe hopefully never because we don't want the compiler to guess. We want it to, to definitely know one way or the other. Um, so yeah, so can't do that. Um, we can uh, just operate on an array, but again, I need to specify the type because it can't guess if, uh, if I don't tell it. So if I don't have that uh, type there, if I get rid of that, then it's going to go, I don't know what this is, um, what type it is. So I need, to, I need to give it a bit of a hint. Uh, whereas this method here is fine because it's a, a generic method. It, I've told it it's going to be um, a string um, collection that's going to be passed in there. So that's fine. So yeah, that, that's a nice little feature. Just makes your code a little bit more succinct. Um, and I gather the way they've done it is there's not any uh, performance um, degradation. It's, it's really uh, one of their key things they're looking at now. Question, Ryan. Question. What implementation do they use for the I enumerable? Uh, I don't know. Um, it would be interesting to see what the um, generated code is for that. So yeah, sort of line 40, what, what's actually being generated there under the covers. Yeah, I mean, I, could, I can change it to another type. Um, is that, is that, was that what your comment was? Or? Oh, yeah, you could. Um, we'll do that later. We won't do that now. <laughs> we could call get type. All right, moving on, because I've got to rip through these. Ah, I keep doing that. Next feature is ref read only. So um, normally, uh, classes are um, reference types, structs are value types, and so that means that when you pass a struct as a parameter to a method, um, it's going to copy that value and you're going to operate on the, on the copy because it's, it's passed by value. Um, but sometimes you do want to pass a struct by reference. So we've had the ref keyword um, in C Sharp already. So you can say, actually, this struct I need to pass by reference. So rather than operating on a copy of it, I'm actually able to, to change it. So in this method here, we've got our P type. So point is just a simple record here with X and Y. Um, I can reassign the P and um, we'll actually we'll run this application and we'll see that... Uh, we can change it. So because we've said this parameter is a ref, we're allowed to change it. So if I press F5, and 
there we go. So, so it was, um, you know, sorry, I'll scroll. Yeah, so it starts off being 1, 1, but inside that method we change it to 2, 3 because it's a ref parameter. Um, now, you might want to pass by reference, but you might not want the, um, the method to be able to make any changes. So we can now say ref read only. So this is a new feature. So by doing this, we can then ensure that we don't accidentally do this. Uh, because now if we try and reassign that struct, we get a compiler error saying uh, you're not allowed to reassign that because it's read only. So yeah, so if, you, if you're dealing with structs, um, then this could be useful just to, 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 to be explicit about, okay, this method, I need it by reference, but because uh, I don't want to do the copy, for example, but I'm not going to make any changes, and I don't want this method to be able to make any changes. Nice. Next one. Um, so we've got a, a lambda expression here on, on line 11. We can now provide default values. So we couldn't do this before. So we've got a, a lambda, and uh, it takes two parameters, a source and an increment, and then on the other side we can see there's a basically an, an, an add, where it's going to add the two together. So now, rather than having to supply both values to that lambda, uh, we can supply a default. So uh, here's an example here where we're just using the default. So yeah, just kind of nice. If you're using lambdas like that, then uh, particularly if you find you're setting the, passing the same value in all the time, maybe that would be a good default and simplify your code a bit. Okay, next feature is aliases. So we've had aliases again for a little while in the language. So we've been able to do this kind of thing where we say using s equals and a type. Um, and so that's been kind of useful, especially if you've got um, uh, two types in different places that have got the same name and you want to be specific about which one you're referring to. Uh, sometimes you might use a type alias to do that. But there's been some limitations. It, it could only be a simple type uh, in the alias, but not anymore. So we can now do type aliases for uh, generic types uh, and arrays and yeah, basically pretty much any kind of type now we can create an alias for. So I can see this being useful, especially the, the, the tuple or tuple, however you want to say it, um, where they end up being sort of littered through your code um, and so maybe making a type alias for that is just going to simplify your code and potentially make, you could even give it a, a sensible name. So maybe not P. Bring chaos to the world. Well, there's, there's many ways to bring chaos to the world. Um, I guess under the covers, it, it's the same type. So even though I've got a, a, like a type C, that is actually um, a, an array of chars because I've got a method here. That's a, a built, like a sort of a, a framework um, method. It's not one I wrote, so it doesn't know about C. It, it just knows about array of chars, but um, this is just an alias, so they are completely assignable. Um, question from John. So in F sharp, um, I believe you can um, pass a generic type into type aliases. Can you do the same in C sharp? I, I, so for example, uh, the, the yeah. Like that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, I don't it's think so. Into the first, um, yeah. That's sort of, is that sort of like currying kind of thing or something? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think yeah. Quite I'd, curry, but yeah, but I think that's sharp. Yeah. I, I do not believe that's possible. Um, I could be wrong, but yeah. Good question, though. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an alias. The, the, the type is still the underlying type. It's just a different way of referring to that exact same type. So yeah, kind of cool. All right, uh, we're getting to the slightly more niche kind of features now. So it, these, these next three, uh, if you think, I don't know why I'd ever use that, you're probably not alone. Um, so inline arrays. Um, so this is really a feature, I guess, uh, where previously you might have written unsafe code. So by unsafe, I mean C-sharp has the unsafe um, keyword, 
where you can then jump into a block of code and it's kind of like um, a lot of the, the rules are then turned off. You can, I think you can write pointers and uh, basically it's, it's unsafe. Um, so you, you're, you're taking risks, but often there's performance reasons you might do that. Um, and I think the, the .NET team and the C Sharp team are, are looking to reduce the times that you need to, to use that and try and bring the same kind of performance and features into the regular language. So we've seen that with Span uh, recently as well, where um, you can sort of operate on sort of contiguous uh, ranges of memory in a type safe way. Um, so this is another feature here where we've got an array. Um, and so we're telling the compiler that this is going to be an array of 10 things. Um, and we don't actually, um, it's kind of odd, this is not actually set up to be an array here, it's just an int in this example, but when we use this type, this, this inline array type here, we can enumerate over it just like it was an array, and the compiler knows that that is going to have 10, there's going to be 10 of those, so I guess it can make optimizations around, I don't have to do bounds checking on, on the, the um, iterating over the, whatever it is. So I don't know why I would use this, but I can imagine there are times when you've got uh, performance reasons to be able to run over a fixed size array. Um, maybe you're doing some kind of memory mapped hardware I.O. or something. Um, and so you know exactly how big that is and you want to do it as fast as you can. Um, yeah, interesting. I can't think of why I would use it, but somebody obviously needs it. So there you go. Um, next feature. So we've had um, in the language or in the framework, I suppose, we've had this obsolete attribute there for a while where you could put that on a method or a class, say, stop using this because we don't want you to use it anymore. So this is kind of the opposite to that. This is an experimental attribute where we can say, yeah, this is here, but we're still working on it. And if you want to use it, you need to know what you're doing. So by default, uh, so I've got this class here called experimental class and I've added the experimental attribute onto that. And I'm getting an error. It's saying, ah, this, this type that you're using is experimental and um, yeah, you, you shouldn't be using it unless you know what you're doing. So the only way that I get around that is to suppress that warning. So by going here and hit the thing and add the the pragmas in to suppress that warning, I can now use that type because I've kind of said, yes, I understand it's experimental and um, okay, let's, let's use it. Um, so I, yeah, could be something you might use in your own code. Um, it'd be interesting to see if we see that coming through in sort of framework code where they, they want to get something out for people to try, but they don't want people to just to go blindly using it. They, they want people to understand this is experimental. Um, so yeah. Last feature is interceptors, and, and this is an experimental feature. Um, uh, slightly different in that um, it's a, a language feature, so you actually have to opt in. So it's included in .NET 8, but because it's marked as experimental, they're, they're not promising it's going to ship. So we've seen this before in C Sharp. They've had experimental features that they've got people to try out, and most of the time they'll end up being features that ship, but we've, we've already had one where um, they said, actually, this is not working out so well. There's some issues with it. We're, gonna, we're not going to ship it. So um, hopefully this one does ship, but um, I guess we'll wait and see. So interceptors, uh, something that's mostly going to work with source generators. So we've had some presentations on source generators um, recently. We had Scott Cabot come and uh, speak uh, late last year, both here and also at DDD uh, on using source generators too. Um, Source generators up until now, um, they can generate code um, that adds to what you've got, but they couldn't really easily replace um, implementations. So you could leave a partial method there as a space for a source generator to hook into, um, or it could just generate new code that you could call, but you didn't really have a way to actually completely replace an implementation of an existing method. So this is where interceptors uh, look useful. So we have, so here's our program. It's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, I, I would say I wrote it, except I, I copied and pasted it. But um, 
we've got a, a, our main method here. We're creating a new instance of C, and then we're calling this method on that, that C type. So let's have a quick look at that. Um, here's our type. It's just got that simple method, takes a parameter. We're doing a console write line with that text there. Groundbreaking stuff, I think you'll agree. Um, what an interceptor can do is it, if we um, intercept this method, we can swap out the body there with, with another implementation. And the idea is that normally you would use a source generator to do that. I didn't want to write a source generator, so I just copy and pasted the, what a source generator would create, which is this. So here's the, a new attribute, uh, intercepts location, and the source generator will, would create this when it ran over as part of the compilation process. Uh, so it, it, at the moment, it takes in a, a parameter of the, the actual file, the, like the absolute path of that file, as well as the line number and character of what we're intercepting. And so you'll notice that line eight character 11 corresponds with uh, right there. I think that's, uh, where's one of them? Yeah, so that's character 11, line eight. So that's, that's the start of that method. Um, seems kind of funny that you'd have to do that, but this would be a source generator um, doing this work. So it, it will know all those kind of details because the compiler is parsing files, generating syntax trees, and it knows all this kind of information. But because it's experimental, they may decide to vary how they implement this. And anyway, so we're saying that uh, when we find this method, uh, we want you to replace it with this implementation instead. Likewise, for these other two lines, so line nine and line 10, we want you to use this other implementation. So if we run this, app, this program, what we'll see is that the first three calls, ooh, what have I done wrong? Uh, don't care about that. Have I changed something I shouldn't have? Uh, oh, okay. So this needs to be the exact path and I created this demo on that computer <laughs> and that's not now the path of this file. So let's fix that up. Uh, on the fly. Now, is it going to do the slashes for me? Yay. All right. And that one. And yeah, so it really does need to be the exact file path. And there we go. So, yeah, so the interceptor and other intercepts, so, so the one, two, and three all got intercepted. The first one got intercepted by the first implementation. The second, the, the second and third got intercepted by that, that second interception. The fourth one wasn't intercepted. So we've been able to choose. So it's not completely replaced uh, the original body that's still there in IL. Um, so yeah, it's basically been able to choose um, to intercept or not which is kind of interesting. So I guess then the question is, well, when would you actually use this? What kind of source generator would make use of this? I'm not really sure, but when I read about this, oh, that's interesting, like, and in fact, I've seen someone do a bit of a prototype of creating it like mocking objects. Um, and I could see that as a possibility that you, in your own code, you might have types that, um, I don't know, maybe do database calls. And so maybe you could use source, you know, like interceptors like this to replace those methods with mocked out or stubbed methods that don't actually hit a database, but um, talk to an in-memory database for, for your unit tests. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure there's other applications that they're thinking of as well, but uh, uh, yeah. So unless you write source generators, you're probably not gonna have to, to deal with it, but for people who do write source generators, and there are some that are included in the um, .NET um, tooling, and, and maybe this will also give a chance to avoid reflection. Um, so things like um, some of the serialization or um, the JSON serialization, serialization that uh, we might have in our applications at the moment, 
might be able to take advantage of this to, to not use reflection so much and improve our performance and reduce memory. Um, yeah, could, could be interesting to see where this one ends up. But it is experimental, so um, you, you actually have to go into the, the project file and say, yeah, I, I want to use this preview feature um, as well. So it, it's not there by default. Um, and I would expect that this is going to change a bit over time. So um, use with care. That is the eight new features in C Sharp 12. So uh, any questions around that? John? Are there any real world uses, use cases for this here? Uh, I. I went looking and I, yeah, I think because it's pretty early, um, I haven't really seen any other than there, that there was a, a yeah, GitHub repo someone had created where that looks like they, that's what they were sort of trying to do a mocking kind of thing. Um, that, that to me, I guess it's, it's working at the source code level. So it's not, it's not working on like mocking out um, SQL client libraries like, yeah. Yeah, so remember, this is generated code, this file here. So the source generator will be generating this. Yeah. So, so this will be the, like the .g.cs file. Yeah. So the source generator, it'll know, okay, I'm in this class and I can figure out there's probably a property like file name and yeah. property like line number and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's going to be a way of adding middleware to a method at the compile time. Yes, yes, yeah. Now, I don't know enough about this to go, like, as you say, like, add a logging attribute and then top and tail that method. I don't know enough about this to go, okay, do I still have access to the original method or is it completely substituting it? Um, yeah, good, yeah, love it. Um, yeah, that, that could be really interesting. Um, yeah, any other questions? No. Uh, to some of the aspect-oriented programming mm. libraries like Fody and PostShop, yes. which uh, can have like an attribute that then does a method replacement or augmentation. Um, yeah. I know in those you get the, um, like you can augment the method you're annotating because you've got access to the original method implementation. Uh, so you might have to, looking at this, you might have to write a bit more about framework though to get access to the, or to turn an attribute into a replacement method and to also access the original implementation. Yeah, no, I mean, I've used tools like Fody before, um, and um, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty handy, but they're, they're sort of post processes, so they're not running as part of the compiler itself. Uh, they sort of run, like the, it compiles and then it, it changes the IL. Um, so, so there's, there's probably things they can do that you won't be able to do with interceptors. Um, so there's, there's, I think there's still a role for that. Um, so yeah, like Fody or PostSharp or, or, or those kind of things. Um, I think, yeah. But some of the things that they do, maybe they could be done this way. So you, you'll, I guess you'll, it'll happen at compile time. So you, you'll get that richness of um, compiler errors and warnings and, and that kind of thing. Um, I know, yeah, like Fody, there, there was sometimes you had to, to jump down and, and actually write IL yourself to, to do some of the things it's doing. So um, if you don't have to do that, that's probably a good thing. So, yeah. Any other questions? Ryan? Uh, I do not remember. <laughs> Good question. So yeah, the B minor arrays. Um, and yeah, whether this can be, I think it can be like a string. Um, whether it can be, yeah, some other type. Yeah, have I got some other type here? I don't know. What's another type I could use here? I'm not complaining. 
I don't know if you have a main method, so I can't run it. But, but yeah, um, yeah. Good question. I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, that, I mean, there's certainly. I think if I do something weird here, it will. It won't like that, or maybe it. I think it'll freak out or something. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, with that, I think we're done. So thanks everyone for coming along. Thanks everyone online. Uh, grab some swag, grab some pizza, hang around and chat if you want to chat. And hopefully we'll see you next month when one of you comes up and says, I'd love to talk next month. Um, uh, otherwise, keep an eye on, on online and uh, meet up and socials. We'll let you know what's happening. But yeah, thanks everyone. Have a good night.